30 years ago today, Lucasfilm released a graphic adventure that would change the landscape of adventure games forever and usher in a golden age for the genre. That game was The Secret of Monkey Island. Today we'll hear from some of the team that created the game and find out the story behind its development. I'm on a retro tip and this is The Making of Monkey Island. This video will make some assumptions, not the least of which being that you have played the game. This isn't an analysis of the game itself, but rather a look at how it came to be, how it was created, and by whom. Before we get to the secret of Monkey Island, it's important to understand the birth and development of adventure games prior to 1990, so a brief history is in order. The genre itself, and indeed the very name, Adventure Game, dates back to Colossal Cave Adventure, first released in 1976. This went by several names, including simply Adventure. In these early days, Adventure Games were what became known as Text Adventures. The player is presented with small paragraphs of text outlining the story and its developments, and the player responds by entering simple one or two word commands. Text adventures became very popular in the late 70s and early 80s, but it wasn't until 1980 that they became graphic adventures, when Sierra Online, then known as Online Systems, released Mystery House for the Apple II. This was the first ever graphic adventure, and, albeit primitive line drawings, depicted an adventure game visually for the first time. This was the birth of the graphic adventure game. Obviously, technological advancements throughout the 1980s allowed these images to become more and more detailed, but these adventure games still had one monumental flaw. They still used command line interfaces, relying on the player to input commands in text. The text passes could be rather frustrating, because they only recognised a set number of commands, many or all of which would be unknown to the player at the outset. The next significant leap for the genre came in 1984, again from Sierra, with the release of the first King's Quest. This was essentially a hybrid of graphic and text adventure. The images on screen were now animated, and the player could move the protagonist around the screen without typing commands, but the majority of the game was still controlled using text-based commands. King's Quest saw a slew of sequels in the coming years, and some other very successful entries in the Quest series, including Police Quest and Space Quest. In 1986, Lucasfilm Games threw their hat into the arena with the release of their first adventure game, Labyrinth. Based on the Jim Henson film of the same name, it sought to sidestep some of the frustration that came with these rigid command line interfaces. David Fox at Lucasfilm developed a system using two word wheels, from which the player could select from lists of available commands and interactive objects, thus creating an instruction for the character. This was far from ideal, but it was a huge step in the right direction, as it eliminated the guesswork synonymous with text-based adventure games. The next adventure from Lucasfilm Games' Maniac Mansion came the following year. Created by Ron Gilbert and Gary Winnick, Maniac Mansion completely flipped the adventure game genre command interface on its head by introducing SCUM, or Script Creation Utility, for Maniac Mansion. This gave the player a selection of available commands, like Walk To, Pick Up, Open and Close. These commands could be selected, and then used to interact with objects or characters by clicking on them. This was a revolutionary step forward for the way adventure games would be played. This interface was obviously far more suited to a mouse, and even by 1987 they weren't standard. It wasn't until the PC port of Maniac Mansion that the real advantage of having a mouse became apparent. Lucasfilm Games followed the success of Maniac Mansion in 1988, with their second scum game, Zack McCracken and the Alien Mindbenders. 
The interface was very similar, although slightly improved, but even at this early stage Lucasfilm were already establishing their style. Their next two graphic adventures were 1989's Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, the graphic adventure, and 1990's Loom. We'll hear more about Loom shortly. But to understand how The Secret of Monkey Island was conceived, we first need to understand a bit more about Lucasfilm Games, and of course, meet the team who would create it. Lucasfilm Games was a subdivision of Lucasfilm founded in 1982. It began making original games for Atari, and all of its games were brought to market by external publishers. It wasn't until 1987's Maniac Mansion that Lucasfilm Games first self-published. The company was small, certainly by today's standards. In fact, that had been George Lucas's only instruction to the studio early on. Stay small, and don't lose any money. The team that would work on The Secret of Monkey Island were Ron Gilbert, the concept's creator. He also did design and programming. Ron had previously done programming for a few of Lucasfilm's games, but most notably designed and wrote Maniac Mansion, conceptualised Zack McCracken, and did design for the Indy and the Last Crusade graphic adventure. Ron brought in two fledgling programmers to assist with the programming design and overall story, Dave Grossman and Tim Schafer. They had both recently started at Lucasfilm, being hired in 1989 as Scumlets, who would help implement the designer's ideas within the Scum engine. They had assisted with bits and pieces for some prior games, but The Secret of Monkey Island would be their first proper project. The art team was made up of Steve Purcell, a cartoonist, notably the creator of Sam and Max, who began at Lucasfilm Games in 1988. He did artwork and graphics for the Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade graphic adventure, graphics for the action game, artwork for Pipe Dream, and did character design and animations for Loom. He'd also designed the cover art for two games, Zack McCracken and Pipe Dream. Mark Ferrari, an illustrator who had done art and animation for Zack McCracken, artwork for Pipe Dream, and did all the background art for Loom. Mike Ebert, another illustrator slash comic book artist, who started at Lucasfilm in 1989 and did actor art for the NES port of Maniac Mansion, artwork for Pipe Dream, and artwork and graphics for the Last Crusade graphic adventure. And Martin Bucky Cameron, who had previously done background art for Zack McCracken, graphics and artwork for the indie graphic adventure, and had worked on a few other Lucasfilm games. Steve Purcell, Mark Ferrari and Mike Ebert would be responsible for Monkey Island's background art, and Steve, Mike and Martin Cameron would do its animations. The art department was overseen by Gary Winnick, who had co-created Maniac Mansion with Ron Gilbert. He didn't work on Monkey Island directly, but oversaw the development as a whole. The other notable team member was Michael Land, who began his Lucasfilm Games career in 1990 as their first in-house composer. Prior to this, Lucasfilm had mostly outsourced the soundtracks for their games. Of course, several other Lucasfilm Games employees no doubt contributed towards the development of Monkey Island, as was the norm at the company. People often did a bit of everything, and it was common for employees outside of a games development team to lend a hand where needed. Quite a mixture of personalities here. Most of the art team were illustrators or artists outside of the world of gaming, and two of the game's lead designers, Dave Grossman and Tim Schafer, had never taken on such a role before. Ron Gilbert first came up with the pirate theme for The Secret of Monkey Island as one of several ideas for adventure game projects after developing Maniac Mansion. Well, I had finished working on Maniac Mansion and I was kind of thinking about another project and I, you know, I came up with a few, you know, ideas that really never went anywhere. You know, they're just ideas and I wrote I wrote down one page and it was very common back at Lucasfilm at the time that people would write little one-page uh, design documents and then pass them around the office. And people would comment on them and give feedback and, you know, you'd sit down and chat with people. And I did this for 
I don't know, maybe probably three or four ideas um, post Maniac Mansion, and nothing really gained a lot of traction. You know, nothing was really super exciting, and I was really kind of thinking about you know games like King's Quest, and you know, had a fantasy environment, which was very popular back then and it i mean it is today you know fantasy is a huge kind of genre in in games and you know king quest kind of had this fantasy genre and i started thinking about well i wonder if that is one of the things that kind of makes it so successful but i'm not a big fantasy fan and i didn't really want to make a game you know about dragons and such and i started thinking about um started thinking about them more and that's really where things like pirates came up because uh, uh, you know pirates actually share a lot in common with fantasy and and i thought well maybe if i did a game about pirates i could kind of do fantasy without actually doing fantasy which i didn't really like and so that's really where the whole idea of pirates kind of sprung up was was from that idea at this early stage, the project was known as Mutiny on Monkey Island. Looking at this early design document, it had only vague similarities with the final game. There were probably two major influences. I just happened to, just by coincidence, you know, read the book on Stranger Tides, which you know Tim Powers wrote. And that, that book was like this real kind of eye-opener for me. Because in that book, there were two things that kind of made everything that I was thinking about for Monkey Island really click. And one was that the protagonist in the story was kind of a fish out of water a little bit, right? He was not a seasoned pirate. He doesn't really understand this world that he's in. That made a lot of a lot of sense to me and a lot of stuff with Monkey Island really clicked at that point because that's when I started thinking about you know the player is really in that situation too right the player is not a seasoned pirate and so it's really nice to be able to push this you know protagonist into the world that doesn't know what's going on because the player doesn't know what's going on and so they can both learn at the same time you know about what it is to be a pirate and and that was so much so that the i mean the very beginning line of monkey island is you know my name is guy super and i want to be a pirate i mean he just states right at the beginning of the game i don't know anything about this so that that was like a, a big inspiration for me you know from kind of a story standpoint and the other was really the pirates of the caribbean ride you know i had always loved that ride as a kid and there's just this feeling to that ride especially at the very beginning at the beginning of the ride you know it's it's very slow and there's lots of blues and it's nighttime and i think you're in the louisiana bayou and and i just i just i love that kind of environment a lot in 1989 while developing the concept ron wrote an article called why adventure games suck this outlined the adventure game tropes that he wanted to avoid while making this new game. These included, end objective needs to be clear, the player must have a sense of what they're trying to accomplish and why, live and learn, no deaths, backwards puzzles, avoid giving the player the solution before presenting the problem. I forgot to pick it up, ensure that essential items can't be made unobtainable if forgotten earlier. Puzzles should advance the story, and puzzles need to make sense. And give the player options. These rules would allow the team to veer away from many of the gameplay aspects common to graphic adventures that had led gamers to become rather frustrated with the genre. Well, with Maniac Mansion, you know, we, we dropped the parser, right? That was the thing I hated the most about Sierra games, was the, the typing, right? I really... I mean, the first thing that really intrigued me about the Sierra games before, you know, I had done Maniac Mansion was just that they were graphic adventures, right? I had played adventure games from like Infocom and, you know, even back in my university days, you know, the original adventure stuff. And I played those and I, I really enjoyed those. And I and I was very intrigued by, by Sierra because these things felt 
um, graphical, and they weren't they weren't graphics like oh well here's a static picture, right? They were they were graphics in, in terms of you know the guy would actually walk around and you move him around and things were animated and and I was really intrigued by that, but I really did not like the parser, which was kind of where Maniac Mansion came from and the whole you know scum interface you know, ditching the parser. So that was one thing I didn't really like. The other thing that I didn't like, and I really hadn't kind of formulated this idea until after Indiana Jones, but was the death part of it. You know, the Sierra games really seemed to revel in death, right? It was it was something that the game would actually chastise you for. And I always felt like the designers of those games actually took pleasure, you know, in, in setting up a situation where the um you know where the player would you know would actually die and there are lots of places in maniac mansion where the player can die and you can get into no win situations and kind of post indiana jones i really thought you know i don't think the player should be able to die you know you should not be able to get into bad situations where you're constantly having to save the game because you're afraid you're going to make a mistake with monkey island you know at least to some degree, probably mostly, you know, I kind of fixed that issue with that game. I found for my personal taste that that was always overdone, that the deaths were too arbitrary. You couldn't see them coming. It would have felt like, like uh, in Lucasfilm's Indiana Jones game, the one that was built uh, before I got there, you could die, but it always felt like you earned it. You know, you, you lost a fight or something because there were... Uh, the reasons why why you were dying. Uh, whereas in a Sierra game, you would just you know sort of accidentally click too far uh, on the art, and you would walk into traffic and be run over by taxi. So that was sort of the I think the big philosophical difference between us. And and we would go out of our way to ensure that we didn't break the fantasy that we never killed you off. Ron assembled a team to work on this new project. We had hired um, some more kind of programmers and you know people like Steve Purcell had done a lot of the art for um, for the Indiana Jones game and so you know I was familiar with him by working on that and we had also hired um, some new programmers to work in the scum system I think there were four of them that we had hired you know I kind of had that pool of people to really choose from you know in terms of programmers and you know steve was kind of a natural because we didn't really have another project going on so you know that's when steve came on and then mark ferrari who did all the art for loom so that's kind of i you know i think how the team kind of emerged so at some point um ron gilbert came in he took tim Schafer and i aside and said look i'm making this game about pirates and i want you guys to work on it with me what do you say and we said sure <laughs> what else were we gonna say? Of course, he said yes, and that's how I wound up on Don Monkey, which was my first real, real game. I did background art for Zach McCracken in in the, using the EGA palette, using solid fields of color uh, for the EGA palette. The next game, the next major game that I did uh, was Loom, which was done in dithered EGA. Loom won a lot of awards because of the way it looked, and the way it looked was directly and almost entirely because we were now using dithered EGA color instead of solid fields of EGA color. And I believe that the next na major game I worked on after that was Secret of Monkey Island. I was already there at the company where I had been creating some creature designs for a game that was canceled shortly after I got there. They discovered I could paint and hired me to do the Zack McCracken cover. From that, I was going to start on Monkey Island, but we all got shifted onto Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade first. I don't remember Ron ever seeking me out. I was part of the small bullpen that got assigned to whatever was happening next. The environment at Lucasfilm Games seemed idyllic. The freedom that the development teams were afforded was significant and the setting was picturesque to say the least. In those days, Lucasfilm Games was based at Skywalker Ranch in California, a beautiful working environment close to the rest of Lucasfilm. I would drive up to the Skywalker Ranch from Oakland, roll into the gates, maybe start the fireplace in the stable house at the back of the ranch where our offices were, settle in and start drawing into Lux paint. 
I can't remember if we would have team check-ins every day. Gary Winnick was the head of the art department, so I'm sure we would update with him at some point. At lunch, we'd walk over to the main house, a big white Victorian house where they served an amazing lunch in a gorgeous dining room with an N.C. Wyeth painting hanging above the fireplace. After that, Gary would say, work or walk? We would usually choose to do a circuit of the ranch, down to the farm area and back past Skywalker Sound, which looks like a winery, and past Lake Ewok. Sometimes we'd get more ambitious and hike up into the hills surrounding the ranch. In the afternoons, we'd labor at our desks and joke around as we worked. I'm sure Ron would come down and do check-ins and let us know what was needed or coming soon. Late in the day, we would start playing one of Larry Holland's World War II games. You could hear the little airplane motor buzz through the cheesy PC speakers. If we goofed around too much during the day, we might stay late, or there might be a screening in the Art Deco Stag Theater at Skywalker Sound. Once, on an after-lunch hike, the artist decided to venture up for a look at George Lucas's observatory. He had built it to house a telescope that someone had given him as a gift. On the way, we found a giant wooden spool that power companies use to transport long lengths of cabling. We rolled the spool all the way to the top of the hill overlooking Skywalker Ranch and let it go. It went careening all the way down the hill and kicked up enough momentum to plow through a fence. Dorks that we were, we ran away and never spoke of it. The location wasn't the only liberating aspect of Lucasfilm Games. The company's ethos was also very relaxed, allowing the development teams to shine creatively, free from deadlines and money-hungry executives. And Ron Gilbert applied that same spirit when leading the Monkey Island team. I didn't realize how much freedom we had until later when I had to have other jobs. We weren't responsible for keeping the company afloat. We were a tiny division of a great big media empire that had lots of movie money and special effects money and sound uh, production money coming in. And, and, and it wasn't until a few years in that anybody even suggested that we should make a profit time and stuff. But I don't remember anybody specifically saying, you need to do this. It was more, you know, we were all 20 something and we were really into what we were doing. Ron had a sense of what he wanted, but he was flexible enough to allow creative people to contribute. To lead a project, you have to find out how to point everyone toward the same goal and then give them the room to invest themselves in it. People do better work when they feel their contributions are valued. The result is stronger when the lead can let the creative team flourish. Although each team member had their role, a lot of the work on Monkey Island was a collaborative effort, as was common at Lucasfilm Games. Brainstorming sessions were common, and ideas were often bounced around. Working on the game, and I was, you know, designing stuff, and and just really reacting, kind of to to what we had seen implemented, and going, oh well, that's really interesting. Let's do more of that. First of all, it was a new, uh, it was a new industry. Nobody had decided at that point what this was about or what this should be about or where it was going. So everybody was in experimental mode. Even the investors were in experimental mode in, uh, mode in those days. So the fact that all the answers hadn't been nailed down and everything that hadn't been nailed down hadn't been excluded left a great deal of wiggle room that is no longer, well, that hasn't been there until recently. So our teams were six to a dozen people. Everybody knew everybody. Everybody was in contact and talking and involved all day long. And everybody was involved in all the discussions there were. Everybody talked about game design. I mean, yes, we were each there to specialize in some part of the game making process. A couple of us were there to do art and that was our area of expertise. A couple of us there were, were there to do programming or game design and that, were, that was their area of expertise. But everybody got together numerous times a day to talk about the art and the game design and puzzles and dialogue and, uh, you know, I mean, there wasn't anything that anybody was excluded from. And there was very little in the games that wasn't actually the sort of collegial uh, summation of what everybody had contributed. It was a far more creative, far more collegial environment than it is now. So we would usually spend one or two 
sort of maybe hour long sessions together, all, all three of us, and maybe with some, some like visitors too, uh, brainstorming about puzzles, puzzle structure mostly, which is all all wrapped up in story and story structure. Of the, all, the, all the puzzles are sort of about people, their weird needs and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, and then we would go off and have responsibilities and and, and him and I were mostly doing, um, we, we were sort of responsible for it, making a scene come to life, right? So it would be like, all right, you're gonna do the scene with these circus guys. And so part of that was, you know, somebody would draw the art, and but we would have to do some like stage direction, uh, which is like, okay, these guys are gonna stand over here, and then when you talk to them, they're gonna walk over here. Uh, if, if anybody does any animations during the conversation, we have to sort of say how and when that's gonna happen. When developing the puzzles for Monkey Island, Ron, Dave, and Tim made sure to bear Ron's rules in mind. Typically we would do it uh, what you might think of as backwards, which is think of the goal first and then think of how you would achieve the goal. So that would start with story. So the um, usual approach um, is is to sort of take the overall idea for the story and sort of break it down into a few acts. And each act has some kind of a goal that the character is trying to achieve and setting the end of it. And then break down that goal into some sub goals that, that sort of make sense. Uh, and then take each one of those and break it down into some actions that you take in order to achieve them. Each action that you take should be hopefully something that makes you feel a little bit clever and is sort of a leap of like, oh, hi, yeah, I've got to do this. This is, is fun in some other way. Uh, and there's there's definitely a, a space between telling people exactly what to do and leaving them lost. You have to kind of aim in the middle somewhere where you've got some information, but maybe not quite enough. And the more you poke at it, the more you learn, then finally you get to a point where you're like, ah, I know what I'm going to do. Search this gap. Uh, the, the stuff that I like best now are the things that aren't um, puzzle puzzles, but that, that sort of use the standard interface to do other stuff. So, uh, I mean, there's the insult sort of fighting, which is good, but also you, around that, you have to puzzle where you have to follow the shopkeeper out into the forest to find the sword master. And I thought that was a clever bit of um, subterfuge. And there's there's one puzzle where you have to, uh, the, the frog is eating through your mugs and you have to keep transporting it from mug to mug uh, as you get there. And I, I, I like those, I think, just because they're sort of breaking, um, breaking the, what we have come to think of as this game and more of the adventure game puzzle, which is just use this on that. And see the reward. For Monkey Island, the scum engine was improved over the last crusade with a seemingly small tweak. Players could now hover over environmental objects to see their description and therefore interact with them. This minor change made exploring the world much easier and far more intuitive. The game was also littered with references and in-jokes, a trend already established in their previous adventures like Zack McCracken. These references included nods to previous Lucasfilm adventure games, Lucasfilm movie properties, and even George Lucas himself. The things that are the sort of specific timely references to something that was in the news like that year mostly you probably wouldn't even notice anymore but the things that are sort of more general references to a certain type of character last longer like like stan the ship salesman is a, is a good example he's loosely based on a real guy right cal worthington is his car salesman um but he was the used car salesman who was on TV a lot in Southern California where I grew up. Uh, 
and people in Northern California uh, or 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 uh, Oregon, which is where he grew up, uh, would know about him. And Tim wrote that scene, never having seen, I think, a, a Cal Worthington commercial. But he still kind of hits the mark because there's there's something sort of universal about that kind of hand wavy, noisy guy who's trying to sell you a car. Dave Grossman even had a little dig at Sierra's adventures by programming in a spoof game over screen. The way that happened was I got the background art for that scene. I think Mike Ebert was the one who drew that one. And uh, there was just like a line over at the edge of the the, 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 um, piece of rock that he was standing on. And it just looked like a crack, like it was supposed to break. And my first thought was, did I miss a meeting? And is there a puzzle about this that I don't know about? <laughs> so I just, <laughs> that night, I like, painted a different version of it where the thing had broken off and then made the piece so that I could animate it dropping down and stepping out there and and, uh, and and put in this whole elaborate thing where the cliff crumbles, but we just make the excuse that there's a rubber tree down there that you bounce off of and you survive but not before seeing the parody of the Sierra death message come up. Ah, oh, sorry you died. No, haha. This isn't that kind of game, this is a Lucasfilm game. The story and puzzles in Monkey Island were, in the end, very well put together, and the game's sense of humour was light years ahead of anything that had come before. The secret of Monkey Island was such a joy to play because its constituent parts were all exceptional, and the artwork was of course a huge part of this. Even the box art designed by Steve Purcell was striking. For the first cover, we worked with an outside designer for the logo, and I designed the illustration to fit with it. I must have started on it pretty early, because I have sketches of a version of Guybrush that's nothing like what he came to be. In the roughs, he was kind of a muscly doofus. I had done the Zack McCracken cover previously, and Ron said he wanted Monkey Island more realistic. That was a stretch for me, but I did what I could with it. In those days, a video game's box art was far more important than it is today. Kids couldn't simply look up a game on the internet to assess its appeal, so sales were made and broken on the attractive box art sat on the shelves. Even the game's copy protection was visually striking, the Dialer Pirate Wheel. The game would give the player a composite face, made up of two different pirate faces. It would then ask for a specific date to be entered, relating to one of several Caribbean islands. An ingenious device, and a bit of fun. During a particular rush period to get the game onto shelves, the team were all hands on deck, so it's possible that Dave Grossman himself assembled your dialer pirate wheel. So a bunch of us did that, there was probably 20, 25 people all went down to this, this uh, warehouse in San Rafael and uh, shrunk wrapped things and we riveted code wheels and packed things in boxes and it was fun actually. It is entirely possible that I riveted your code wheel myself. Mm. The game's artwork, all drawn in deluxe paint, a program familiar to any Amiga owner in the late 80s and early 90s, was even more impressive. To understand why, we need to rewind a few years. Neither I nor any of the other artists who were being hired by Lucasfilm or Sierra Online or virtually none of those people were computer enthusiasts. Some of them were, but most of them weren't. And of course, none of those people were pixel artists. There was no such thing. We were traditional illustrators who were proficient at making imagery using traditional media so we came to this new platform with a set of expectations about color and about detail and about 2D visual skills in creating atmospheric perspective and, and you know, linear perspective and, you know, all sorts of, of things that went into it to making a vivid 2D image that were rendered virtually impossible by this low-res pixelated medium with 16 horrible EGA colors and nothing else available. It made it almost impossible to do what we were trained as traditional illustrators to do. 
So rather than being people who were in love with pixels and maximizing the visual and aesthetic potential of pixels the way artists do today, we were people who saw pixels as a technological misfortune that we had to somehow overcome as much as possible and compensate for. So when I sat down to do Zach McCracken, the first thing I started doing was dithering the 16 awful EGA colors that we had to use. You know, there was this, this acid green and this acid magenta and this sort of fire engine red and this buttercup yellow. I mean, there were, there were no useful, I mean, little spots of saturated color are very important in a traditional illustration, but those spots become focal issues because, uh, vocal spots, because they are supported by a whole lot of the painting that's done in darker, less saturated background recessive colors. And there were no recessive colors in the EGA palette, except for black and, well, except for gray, really. I mean, even the brown was this bright orangey mustardy kind of orangey, well, not orangey, yellowy kind of brown. There just were no useful colors. So I was being asked to draw, you know, architectural interiors and landscapes without any of the colors I needed. So I just began to checkerboard dither the ugly colors we were forced to use with into more useful colors. The greatest hurdle faced by the Monkey Island art team was the EGA color palette, which was a mere 16 colors and most of them unappealing. We were challenged by the color palette. There was a good black, dark blue, and yellow. That helped the night scenes. Some other colors were not so forgiving. You could shade a face with a mealy brown or a dark red. It never quite looked right. Ron would have something in mind for all the locations and then gave us room to explore. To combat this, Mark fought hard to use a technique called dithering in the background art. Dithering is a technique by which a richer colour palette, or at least the illusion of one, can be created by blending the available 16 colours. For example, this image during the Zach McCracken era of graphics would become this if dithering was used. The only problem was, dithering would not compress. We finished Zach McCracken and all those backgrounds with solid fields of EGA colour, and it has its own classic look now, but it's, it's still not a look I would want to look at for very long. Uh, at the end of that project, we were in crunch mode. We needed to be working over a couple of weekends. They didn't want us hanging out on Skywalker Ranch through the weekends. They let us take our PCs home to work. Uh, and while I had my PC at home and had finished what I needed to do there, I just decided to draw a nice looking EGA picture. Uh, a scene of rows of receding hills covered in crests of live oak trees against a twilight sunset with a crescent moon and some stars and a, a, a sunset, sort of an orange band of sunset at the bottom fading up into this blue twilight sky. I did it all in dither. It was just so beautiful compared to what we were doing for Zach McCracken. And I saved it to my hard drive. And then I went back to work on Monday. and. Uh, when I finished up what I needed to do Monday morning enough to go to lunch, I decided just to put that picture up on my screen and go to lunch. Just let it sit there. I shared an office with the art director then. His desk and my desk were in the same room uh, next to each other. And I just put that image up and went to lunch. I figured people could take a look at this. It, it was really, at some level, it was, it was an intentional complaint. We could be doing this if we could use dither. So that picture was up there for quite a while. And when I came back, Steve Arnold, who was then the head of the Lucasfilm game division, was in an animated conversation with Ron Gilbert about why Dither didn't compress. And within a few weeks or a month at most, Dither did compress. Um, Ron and his team had made changes to the SCUM engine that allowed for that. So the result was Loom. Um, I did all the backgrounds for Loom because I was the guy there that understood drawing in Dither. I was in no position to implement the ability to draw in Dither. That was all Ron, but uh, I was the guy who knew what to do with Dither on screen. So Loom was our first attempt at a Dithered EGA game. And it won a lot of graphics awards because at places people thought this was VGA art and were very surprised because VGA art wasn't really being used by gaming companies yet at that point. It was all EGA. 
So that worked out really well. Secret of Monkey Island was the next major game we did after that. And Secret of Monkey Island was, among other things, my doctoral thesis on dithered EGA art. It was where I got to apply everything we'd learned about how to use the EGA palette as dithered art during Loom. So that was sort of the progression from EGA art in Zach McCracken to the EGA art you have in Secret of Monkey Island. The background art was split more or less in three between Mark, Steve and Mike Ebert. This created a small problem. As each artist had their own distinctive style, they sidestepped this issue by assigning each artist their own areas, so it was less noticeable for the player. I was doing most of the background work for Loom. I only did about a third of the background work for Monkey Island, but I did most of the background work for Loom probably because I was the only person there who had ever given a second thought to dither or wanted to try that yet. Because Loom was the first time we really used dithered art in a game, we did not understand going into Loom what the impacts of that were going to be. Um, but one of the impacts of that, that nobody saw coming till Monkey Island, was that once you were able to get more color choices into a game uh, with Dither, personal artistic style suddenly began to actually be possible visibly on the screen. When we did Zach McCracken with solid fields of EGA color, everybody's art looked the same. It didn't matter whether you were me or Steve Purcell or, you know, uh, Andy Warhol or Vermeer, your artwork was going to look pretty much like everybody else's because there were so few choices to make about what color to use or how to apply it to the image. Just dithering those colors gave us enough additional choices about color and how to apply it. And at that point, the images that Steve Purcell drew with dither and the images that I drew with dither looked like two different artists drawing into slightly different styles. So all of a sudden, you know, up until then, it had been no problem to have three artists working on a game. It was just going to look like one artist's work, no matter how many artists you had helping. As of Monkey Island, at least, you could really tell the difference between Steve's dithered artwork and my dithered artwork. So for Monkey Island, the way we solved that was we divvied up the different environments and handed them out to different artists. So when it came to Melee Village, I was assigned that and I did all of the exteriors for Melee Village and, and some of the interiors. When it came to the Monkey Village uh, on Monkey Island, that was all Steve Purcell. When it came to some of the other places, it was all Mike Ebert. By assigning all of the images for a single environment to a single artist, that way, when people moved from one place to another and this looked completely different, it was because we were someplace different now. It wasn't because of, hey, who drew this? We actually had to disguise those differences in artistic style. They were a liability all of a sudden. Um, but for Loom, we had no idea that was going to happen. I was fine doing backgrounds, but Mark was able to take them to another level. I tended to get assigned to weird or funny subjects, or maybe they ended up that way because of how I did them. I did the stone monkey head and Stan's dock with the grog machine. I can't remember if the machine was part of the assignment or something I added to make it more fun and anachronistic. I liked working on the big stone monkey head because it's silly and I like strange stone Zardoz type icons and stories. Dithering wasn't the only technique used in deluxe paint to get the most out of the limited palette. Mark also utilized color cycling. I didn't go in understanding the technology. I didn't go in interested in the technology. I just went in trying to figure out how to make this damn thing do what I wanted it to do. Uh, and as such, I never sat down knowing how to do what I was here to do today. I sat down to figure out how to do. I was reinventing the wheel all the time because I'd never heard of wheels. And when we started working on artwork for the game, one of the first things we did was that lookout point with the stone arch where the old man is sitting by the bonfire staring out sea. And we were debating, I mean, first of all, we were, I was 
my first big challenge there was drawing firelight with even in dither with these 16 horrible colors. Um, you know, the way a fire looks like fire uh, is not just that it is orange and yellow, but that it is casting orange and yellow light on and shadows onto things. We really didn't have the colors for it. But part of that debate ended up being about whether or not to animate that fire at all. Again, all the art direction decisions that were made by disk space, just the extra frames to animate that little bonfire were a serious calculation in terms of consumption of disk space. And we were very early in the game and Ron didn't want to just start, you know, eating up disk space with gratuitous environmental animations until we were sure we could. So we were talking about just drawing that fire as a frozen part of the art, which really didn't appeal to me, again, for artistic reasons. That was when Ron called my attention, I believe, to the color cycling feature in D-Paint. D-Paint came with this capacity to identify a little row of colors of whatever length you wished in the palette. Um, and of course, in those days, the palette was 16 colors, so the length was pretty narrow no matter how you cut it. But to identify a little row of colors and tell this particular art file to switch the positions of those colors in order in a loop at whatever speed you chose. Uh, so with 16 colors, there wasn't a whole lot you could do with color cycling. I mean, you couldn't color cycle the whole palette. Otherwise, the whole screen would just become a jumble of changing colors. So you got to pick just two or three colors. But Ron said, here's a way to make things look like they're moving on screen maybe you could just use this with the fire somehow to, to give it some motion without us having to do frames. And that was, unbeknownst to me, the beginning of my color cycling career right there. Because I, of course, once I discovered a new tool, given 10 years of using that tool, I had to go back and figure out how I could use this better, how I could stretch this further, you know, what we might be able to do to get around the apparent limitations of this or that involved a lot of happy accidents along the way that opened my eyes to a possibility I would never have just thought of on my own, etc. I had 10 years to play with this, so I got to do things with it nobody thought were possible. Nobody ever imagined would be possible when they first saw the color cycling tool as presented by EA. The character animations were very accomplished too. Animating emotions and reactions was no mean feat where this kind of pixel art was concerned. There was a lot of animation to be done, so there was plenty to split between me and Martin and Mike. On Indiana Jones, I had done the first special case animation, where a character does something that is specific to one moment in the game. In the case of Indy, it was him slipping down a bank. Special case animations were something I guess I had a knack for, so I would get those assignments. We had lots of characters that would appear in cycles of animation. The cycles were designed by the animators to seem randomized. Martin and Ebert were really great at figuring out how to sequence the motions to get the variety so it would feel more spontaneous. They were also good at creating modular characters that could be used to make multiple variants of all the extras. I was good at goofy stuff. I had fun working on the ghost ship in the Sword of Lava Underworld. The skeleton pirates were fun because the blue lent themselves to a kind of glow effect. I enjoyed getting to figure out and animate Guybrush and LeChuck. If my comic background helped, maybe it was in making stuff up on the fly, which is also a help for storyboarding. The challenge on the computer was in working in 16 colors and trying to give life to tiny characters where you can barely see their faces. The challenge was getting these little figures to act with their bodies. Of course, Monkey Island looked different depending on the platform. The Amiga version was significantly better looking than the DOS EGA version, and then it was entirely redone in VGA. You know, we still only had 16 colors, right? All the way through the first version of Monkey Island. And it really wasn't until the VGA graphics became a lot more standard that we got access to 256 colors, which Maniac Mansion was in, you know, redone in. And I think when people play Maniac Mansion or play Monkey Island today, most people are playing the VGA version. So, you know, color space really changed. And then, you know, I don't know that memory was really that big of a deal just because the scum system was really good at being able to shuffle stuff in and out of memory as you needed it. I mean, it did, the more memory did allow us to do 
more complex animations. And you really saw that starting with um, the Last Crusade game. You know, because the Maniac Mansion, there are no what we call special case animations, right? People walked and that was it. When Indiana Jones came out, we started doing kind of special animations. So when Indiana Jones had to do something special, there was this special animation that he would do that would only be seen in that one place in the game. And having more memory and more disk space kind of allowed us to do more of those. And then by the time... Like the island came out, you know, we had even more disk space and even more memory to, you know, to, to play with. And so we could do even more, you know, of those special animations. And the resolution was a lot higher. I mean, Maniac Mansion on the Commodore 64 was 160 pixels across. And by the time Monkey Island came out, it was double that. So it was 320 pixels across. So having more resolution, more colors, you know, more memory were all, were all kind of nice. But I don't think anything really fundamentally changed. Part of the magic of the secret of Monkey Island was its diverse roster of quirky characters. Not the least of which being the game's lovably goofy protagonist, Guybrush Threepwood. He wasn't your typical video game hero. I always thought about Monkey Island, you know, the protagonist, which later became Guybrush, as kind of being a seasoned pirate, right? And that's really, you know, if you look at the Sierra games, you know, you're playing Police Quest and you're a seasoned cop in Police Quest and you're, you know, all these things, you're, you're a seasoned person and the player is not a seasoned pirate. And so it's really nice to be able to push this you know, protagonists into the world that doesn't know what's going on because the player doesn't know what's going on. It helps with the game design because you can introduce the main character to things at the same time you introduce the, the player to things. The origin of the somewhat unusual name Guybrush is an interesting one. In those days, a, a movable sprite on screen was called a brush. In fact, I'm pretty sure that's what the tool called it. There was a pull down menu in Deep Paint called brushes or something like that, I think. And so this any anything that you picked up and moved around on screen, any bit of art that you picked up and moved around the screen was called a brush. So character sprites were referred to as brushes. And as we were in the early stages of designing the game, our, I think the designer's uh, first intent was that there would be a male protagonist and a female protagonist, and the player could decide whether to play the young pirate as a, you know, as a man or a woman. In the end, I think that that alternative was eliminated because we realized it was going to mean a dual set of every protagonist animation in the game and that tiny bit of floppy disk space we had in which to ship the game simply wouldn't accommodate that many animation frames. So, but before we had figured out that there wasn't any way to fit that particular option onto the disks, we were talking, uh, having one of these group conversations about narrative aspects of the game where Ron and Steve Purcell and Gary Winnick and I and Bucky Cameron and a couple of programmers, I don't remember who at this point, were all sitting in Gary's office just shooting the bull, as we say, um, about all of these things that weren't in most of our job descriptions or areas of expertise, but we were all people with interesting minds, creative people with good senses of humor, and we were all having this thing. And what we were discussing at the moment was what to name this protagonist, these two protagonist characters. You know, I think they came up with a name for the woman first. And then I think Ron asked, so, okay, so what do we call the guy brush? And Steve Purcell said, well, how about Guy Brush? And everybody looked at each other and said, well, that's great, okay. And that's how Guy Brush got his name. That decision wasn't made by some designer sitting at his desk alone someplace or talking with the other designers. That came out of one of these pal around conversations that happened five times a day there. His surname, Threepwood, came from a P.G. Woodhouse novel, The Brinkmanship of Galahad Threepwood. The other characters are equally well designed, from Guybrush's independent love interest Elaine Marley and arch nemesis the ghost pirate LeChuck, to the supporting cast of down and out pirates and Melee Island inhabitants. Every single character not only has a unique persona and sense of humour, but adds depth to the overall story. Stan, the used ship salesman, 
Herman Toothrot, the down on his luck hermit marooned on Monkey Island, the list goes on. The Secret of Monkey Island had a strong female character in Elaine, but also with Carla, the Swordmaster. The reveal that she was in fact a woman added gravitas to Guybrush's eventual encounter with her. Carla was named and modelled after a Lucasfilm Games employee. You know, Elaine, Elaine was kind of switched to a woman. Originally, the person who was supposed to be the governor of the island was Governor Fat, who appeared in Monkey Island 2 as a governor island. And so I switched, you know, I switched um, her to, I switched that character to be Elaine uh, in, in Monkey Island. The Swordmaster, I'm not really sure exactly how the Swordmaster came about. I mean, I do remember having this weird questioning about about everyone's assumption at the time, you know, on the team was really that the Swordmaster was a man. So I remember thinking, well, what if, what if she was a woman, right? That would be interesting, you know? And then there was this woman who worked in the product support department at Lucasfilm um, named Carla. And I, I, don't, I don't know how it happened, but even if you look at the picture of the Swordmaster in Monkey Island, that is Carla from Product Support. It looks exactly like her. And so it was, I, I'm, and I'm not really sure how that happened, right? So I'm, I'm not really sure how, how that character became Carla from Product Support. But, um, but there was that, that initial questioning of like, well, why does the Swordmaster have to be a man? Let's, let's make the Swordmaster a woman. Of course, the build-up to the Swordmaster encounter is one of the most well-loved aspects of the game, the insult sword fights. On Melee Island, a pirate's most valuable weapon is not his sword, but his sharp tongue. Author Orson Scott Card, most known for his 1985 novel Ender's Game, recently made into a film, was brought in to contribute. Lucasfilm Games approached me during the time that I was reviewing games for Compute Magazine and a couple others. In those days, the big game consoles had not yet taken over. Commodore 64 and Atari were still treated as valuable game platforms. Apparently, someone at Lucasfilm Games liked the kind of things I said in my reviews of their games and those of other teams, and I was invited to visit and consult with them. I did a thousand ideas in an hour session at Larkspur Landing, and several other things I did in my writing classes at the time, but what I liked most was looking at various games under construction. The one nearest completion was Loom, with a fascinating, innovative interface. During the playthrough, I made a couple of comments about very slight improvements that might be helpful. As far as I know, they used none of my suggestions. Why would they? But somehow they still found a reason, known only to them, to recognize me in the acknowledgements. The game that I contributed to most was Monkey Island. I was delighted with the concept that instead of a Twitch game, where conflicts are resolved by pounding on a control button or key at a very fast rate, Ron had come up with a dialogue-centered way of winning duels. When you start the game, you have a selection of very lame insults. The computer AI also has lame insults, but they have a few better ones, which can beat yours. Every insult you hear is added to your selection of insults, and eventually you earn your way into killer insults that defeat all comers. And for that reason, instead of keeping the fun for themselves, they asked me to come up with the insults. When I got home to Greensboro, I asked my kids to help. What insults have they heard among elementary school and middle school kids? The lamer, the better, I said. So they came up with some terrific, embarrassingly bad insults to be the original selection. They also suggested a few of the better ones, but they had the most fun coming up with insults so stupid that saying one was more embarrassing than having one aimed at you. Then it was my job to come up with sword fighting appropriate insults on a higher and higher order. It was one of the most fun yet challenging writing tasks I've ever done. Of course, the final decision on whether to use all or any of my suggested insults rested entirely with the game's design team, and I never checked to make sure whether they used my insults. They did give me credit for all of them, which was generous, and maybe the insults in the game all originated with me and my kids. That would be cool. My aging brain does not remember any of the insults now. My son Jeffrey, now a game designer, played through Monkey Island several times, and because he only knew the opening insults, he got a kick out of the advanced ones as he played. I never play the game. When I was reviewing games, Jeffrey would play them through until he knew how they ended. 
Then he would demo them for me, along with his comments on the gameplay, story, design, etc. I paid him half the pittance I was paid for my reviews. Odd how 50 bucks seemed like almost nothing to me, but a fortune to my son at the time. The fact that he loved the game made me feel confident that I had not let down the team at Lucasfilm Games. In the end, many of the insults were created by Dave and the Monkey Island team, as the retorts learned would need to have two uses. One as comebacks to the pirates insults in order to beat them, and two to talk back to the Swordmaster during Guybrush's duel with her. This meant pairing the comebacks with an entirely new set of insults. I mean, we were working on the game and, and we just sort of uh, got this information that Orson Scott Card had written, was writing some, uh, some insults. Uh, and come back for us. But the instructions we got were, you know, just take these and if you can use them, use them. And if they don't work for you, then don't worry about it and just make up some more stuff. And, and so because he didn't really have all the context for what these were going to need to do, which is, um, you know, A, they needed to be uh, sort of matched pairs of, of, of insult and come back. Uh, that needed to be distinct from one another, and that also were going to need to serve double duty when you got to the Swordmaster. You were going to have to use all your, your comebacks again in, a, in another uh, context. Um, that's a very narrow box uh, that he was not given. And so, you know, we just got a, a kind of a list of interesting insults. And, and so what wound up happening was that Tim and I crafted almost all of that, but some of the insults are still in there. And I think mostly with different different comebacks. So, you know, Scott's fingers are, are still in there somewhere. All of Monkey Island's elements blended perfectly to submerge the player in this intriguing pirate-filled world, and its distinct soundtrack played no small part in this. The soundtrack's composer, Michael Land, had started at Lucasfilm Games in 1990, his background was not only as an accomplished musician, with experience in creating electronic music, but also as a programmer. Hired as their first in-house audio programmer and composer, his first project would be The Secret of Monkey Island. The soundtrack consisted almost entirely of Caribbean-inspired music, with many characters and areas in the game having their own distinct theme. He struggled with the music's fluidity, matching the music to the action happening on screen. An issue he went on to fix for the game's sequel with the development of the iMuse interactive music system, but that's a story for another time. The Secret of Monkey Island is undoubtedly a cult classic, the culmination of extraordinary talent, gorgeous artwork, a great soundtrack, lovable characters, an unmatched sense of humour, and most importantly, a well-crafted narrative. But what solidified it in the hearts of gamers so profoundly that it's still so admired 30 years on? For some insight on this, let's hear from some of the game's fans. The reason I love The Secret of Monkey Island is undoubtedly the humour. It has to be, and I'm sure lots and lots of people will say this. But for me it's the humour because I discovered this off the back of playing Sierra's Police Quest, which is as straight-laced and as unfunny as a game can be. That's not to say it's not enjoyable. So this was so refreshing when I discovered it. When I fired it up, in fact, before it even loaded into the game, you had things like the Dialer Pirate uh, copy protection kit. And of course, as soon as you get into the game, it becomes infinitely quotable. You fight like a dairy farmer, Pete. If for some reason you've never played this game, do it because the graphics hold up superbly. The script writing is a masterpiece. The jokes are still as funny as they ever were. And through the use of something like ScumVM, you can do away with all compatibility problems and you can enjoy this as much as I did the day it came out. The Secret of Monkey Island truly is, in my opinion, one of those games that everybody should play at least once in their life. So, Secret of Monkey Island. Wow. Um, the thing that always comes to mind with this game for me, uh, ooh, way back in 1990 when it was released by Lucasfilms, is um, the sheer number of discs it came on. I mean, eight discs, I think, on the game in, on the whole. And, um, you know, it was a very innovative, um, very important game. Um, and um, luckily, uh, on my Amiga at the time, I'd, I'd, I'd sprung out for the extra disc drive, so you could have two discs going at once. 
but still eight discs was always um, a bit nervy for me or any number of discs because uh, floppy disks were so corruptible and um, with eight discs all you needed for one of, was for one of those discs to um, stop working and the whole game was ruined so I remember um, sitting there and hearing the old uh, Amiga whirring away and crunching the disc as they were want to do and just hoping the thing was going to load every time. Um, but the game itself, um, the adventures of uh, Guybrush, um, what a great game. Opened things up in a big way for point and click adventures. Hope you enjoy the game should you revisit it and uh, if you're a retro gamer you really should. My relationship with Monkey Island isn't the same as most other people of my age. I'd always heard that Monkey Island was good, but I didn't actually play it until a couple of years ago. I'm a lifelong fan of adventure games, specifically, in fact, LucasArts adventure games. I've played The Dig, I've played Day of the Tentacle, I've played Grim Fandango. Obviously, I'd heard of Monkey Island and I was always conscious of its impact on the genre. I knew the music, I'd heard that loads of times before. It's a certified classic. I just kept missing out on playing it. It's one of those classics that that you just never get around to. It's like being into films and yet somehow never having seen The Godfather. Anyway, I finally got around to playing it on my old DOS laptop and I was staggered by how good this game is. There's no nostalgia for me here. There's no rose-tinted memories of loading up old floppies on my Amiga. This is just straight up great writing, great puzzles, great jokes. The humour, in fact, has survived surprisingly well. It still feels really 90s, but it had me laughing out loud for real. And when you consider that that's me reading pixely text off of a screen with no voice acting, that is a testament to the quality of that writing. There was always this nagging doubt in my mind that Monkey Island wouldn't live up to the hype, that nostalgia was warping people's opinion of this game. I'm glad to say that that is absolutely not the case. Monkey Island is a certified banger. It gets so much right that I don't hesitate to recommend this game to other people who missed out just like I did. Although a huge success from a technical standpoint, the Secret of Monkey Island wasn't an immediate commercial success. Sierra was still outselling Lucasfilm's graphic adventures by a wide margin, certainly in North America. In fact, most of the team didn't realise it had become such a revered game until much later. We got ahead of marketing a Lucasfilm, a guy named Doug Glenn. And I think he had lived in Europe. I think he lived in Italy for several years. And so he he was always like, we have to go to Europe. We have to go to Europe, you know. And I think Sierra Online had kind of licensed the King's Quest stuff to, I think, Activision. It's like mm -hmm. the old Activision, but uh, to Activision. And so I think, I think Activision kind of, you know, had the rights to all of Europe for this stuff. And I think one of the things that Doug Glenn did was he said, no, we're going to go to each individual country and do deals with distributors in each country and i think his his philosophy at the time was if we do that these individual distributors in germany and spain and the uk and stuff will have a lot more vested interest in this game because it is a game for their market right and i think he was really right about that and i think i think that's one of the things that kind of made monkey Allen really explode in europe is is that you know those those deals were not europe as this big you know giant entity but it was deals with spain and deals with france and deals with germany and and i think it gave those people a lot more ownership over the title and i think helped you know, help them promote it. I mean, today you release a game and 24 hours later, right, everyone's playing it and there's reviews everywhere and all that stuff. That wasn't the case back then. You know, we would release a game and it would spend months, you know, in manufacturing, getting hundreds of thousands of floppy disks pressed and then it had to be shipped to stores. And then, you know, so it was months between when we would finish a game and it would actually come out on the shelves. and. And I, I know I was very disappointed in the kind of sales of Monkey Island, but you know, I had started working on Monkey Island 2 just immediately, right? Monkey Island 1 finished, and I went on vacation for two weeks, and I came back and I started working on Monkey Island 2. And I do kind of wonder, right, if, 
if we had had immediate feedback on the success of the game, maybe I wouldn't have been allowed to do Monkey Island 2. But I could almost start Monkey Island 2 without knowing how well Monkey Island 1 did. And so maybe that was a, a kind of blessing in disguise. You know, it's like Monkey Island 1 came out. And I mean, it did okay. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a flop by any means. And then Monkey Island 2 came out. And I left Lucasfilm right after Monkey Island 2 came out. And so I didn't... Um, I don't know how well it did because I wasn't privy to any of that, you know, sales information after I left. There were two games I did, and they were fun games, and I was very proud of the games. But at that point, I started Humongous Entertainment, and that was really my focus, right? Which was making these adventure games for kids. And I kind of, in some ways, forgot about Monkey Island. And it really wasn't until probably 2003 or four when I started my blog. And I started doing blogging stuff, and there were just just throngs of people would come to my blog. And that was actually a little bit of a surprise for me. And I'm like, well, I'm like, yeah, and that was like, you know, 10 years ago. Why are you still playing it? And and that's that's when I kind of personally realized what an absolute cult following, you know, that those two games had was was when I when I really when I started my blog and I started interacting with people and you know, I made a couple of you know trips to Europe just as vacations and stuff, and I thought, oh, it'd be fun to do little meetups with people, and just the sheer number of people that came to those meetups, right, just blew me away. So I was, I, I think that's the point that I kind of realized that it had of the following that it had. I, you know, success is is definable on very varying kinds of terms, like. Um, we got recognition like at the game developers conference and stuff. Like other other game developers liked it, knew that, um, and we all liked it. You know, I think we we knew that we had made something good. Um, just in terms of actual monetary sales, I mean, Lucasfilm never did that great in the uh, U.S. market. We were certainly um, overshadowed significantly by Sierra uh, domestically. Uh, but we did have a lot of European fans when we would go there. You know, that was like a significant uh, portion of, of the income we got from any was Europe. And I, I, you know, I mean, I, there's, there's no particular moment where I was like, oh, hey, this is a, this is a success. And this is a failure. I guess I always felt like it was a success, um, mm -hmm. just because it it came out, which is I didn't realize even how unusual that could be until much later in the career everything, everything we did actually released uh it came out and and people played it and we got fan letters and you know the people seemed to like it and i didn't um i didn't have a lot of uh insight or interest into what were the financials of you know how much do we spend on this and how much are we making that was somebody else's job we had made something that was fun and various people were telling me that it was fun so in, in, in that instance i knew right away that, that it was a um, and, and the fact that people still talk about it, though, is um, that continues to amaze me on a daily basis. <laughs> like so many other things have come out. The fact that we made something that was not just good and fun, but that actually continues to be good and fun many years after its release is, is um, not something that I understood at the time, nor would I know how to plan for that. People need to remember we had we did not sit down to make a classic computer game. N nobody ever gave it a thought. Monkey Island wasn't as good as it was because we set out to make a classic computer game. It was as good as it was because everybody there was incredibly creative. Everybody there was very hardworking and everybody there really loved to make the best thing they could make the best way they could possibly make it no matter what it was, whether it was lunch. We just thought we were making a computer game and making the best game we could make because that was fun for us. And when it was over, I don't think we gave the game another thought. I did not discover that Monkey Island had become a classic game until 2005. I went on doing, I went on to develop these techniques with color cycling and palette shifting and things that made me literally the only guy in the world who could do those things with VGA, 256 color, 8-bit art, and I was beating away potential employers with a stick and, you know, one of the it guys for a very short time. 
and then at the end of the 90s they they came out with 3d cad rendered art and within a year or two everything i was famous for doing was irrelevant i mean i suddenly i went from being one of the most sought after computer game artists in the country to having no work for years at all and went on to other things i assumed that my career in computer gaming art was over and since my career had always been about art not about computer gaming it honestly i mean financially it was a catastrophe for me but in every other way it, it didn't bother me all that much i just went on to do other things and assumed that was the end of things uh and then after a couple of years in omaha i came out to seattle washington for a on a two-week trip to a, to attend the wedding of some friends there and attend a science fiction fantasy convention happening in seattle intending to go back to omaha at the end of that period of time and on my last night in town i called an old friend from the computer gaming industry whom i'd worked for back in my heyday to say hey i'm in seattle uh would you like to get together for dinner and he said yes would you like to work for me and i said what he said yeah i i'm the head of a division of a pretty large subcontractor doing computer games would you like i really need you because what I didn't know while I was out of the industry was that handheld gaming platforms and smartphones were now powerful enough to run what we used to think of as desktop computer games, but not powerful enough to run 3D CAD rendered cinematographic console games. And suddenly they needed people who could do the old style 8-bit art and nobody knew how anymore because everything had been replaced. So. I started doing this work again all of a sudden. And on our first day at this new company, Steve was walking me around from cubicle to cubicle, introducing me to all of these, by then I was in my late 40s, introducing me to all of these 20 something year old artists, pixel artists. Hi, hi, this is a new guy working for our company. Today's his first day, I just want to introduce you. His name is Mark Ferrari. And several times these kids would look up and go, because they were kids to me. I mean, they were 25 years old, but to me at that point, these were fresh faced kids. So they would look up and go, you're not the Mark Ferrari. <laughs> the Mark Ferrari? Uh, I don't think so. Like Monkey Island? I said, how the hell do you know about Monkey Island? I mean, this was way back at the beginning of my career. I had forgotten about the secret of Monkey Island. Why do you 25 year old kid know about Monkey Island? I grew up playing that game. That was one of my favorite games. I can't believe you're working for us. This went on and on. I mean, it was just this, this sort of growing wave of astonishment that the Mark Ferrari was working for their company now. That was when I found out that Secret of Monkey Island was a classic game. The Secret of Monkey Island was a success story that nobody saw coming, even the development team but it changed the face of adventure games forever, becoming a timeless classic with gameplay and humor still as appealing today as it was in 1990. Secret of Monkey Island is not just a classic because of the way it looks. It's not just a classic because of the way it left from Zach McCracken to, you know, EGA Secret of Monkey Island. In addition to that, those were games that were about storytelling. Beyond their gifts as artists, programmer, designer, and administrator, which were all considerable. They were gifted storytellers. And the reason these games are classic, more than anything about the Scum Engine, or the look of the art, or any of the rest of that, the reason they're classic is because their exercise in storytelling was so good. So that when somebody sat down to play these games, they were involved in discovering strange places, meeting interesting people, engaging in relationships, solving puzzles, mysteries, discovering. It, it, was, it was a giant cavalcade of mental and emotional creative exercise. When those games were replaced by first person shooters, all that narrative went away. And for years and years, all you did, then it was all about autonomic response and dopamine loops. It was all about developing muscular and nervous thumb twitches as you ran down an endless, visually interesting, but airless and repetitive hallway, kicking, punching, stabbing, blowing up, and knifing whatever you encountered along the way. There was often some little story scenario attached at the beginning at the end to frame this somehow, but there was no, none of the same kind of exercise. 
Um, it wasn't because those games were too slick technologically that people got bored with them. It wasn't because they were produced after the innocent age and they were all the same. It was because they weren't doing the thing. They weren't doing the thing with your brain and your creativity that adventure games had done before. They weren't storytelling games. People don't understand that their entire existence is storytelling, but it is. And that, once you understand that, a whole lot of other things fall into place in very different ways than they do for people who think it's all about some objective or mechanical aspect or approach. It's the secret of Monkey Island. Perhaps that is the true secret of Monkey Island. Thanks for watching.